The only real hope and change you'll ever get is from God. It's going to come from the Lord or it's not going to come at all. It's going to come when you admit that you can't do it and that you've got to have His help. You know, in the Bible, it points, well, in several books, it points to you. You're not going to have memory of all this wrong stuff that happened to you on earth. You're developing a like or dislike loyalty or disloyalty to things. That's what you're doing. The memory part, there's going to be no need for that. When God removes all the tears from the eyes of those who were in this earth and they had experienced such horrific lifestyles, they're not going to remember that. When a child or a person dies and they die in, in a traumatic fashion, that's going to be gone. They're going to be whole and complete. And then darkness itself will be cast away, totally done away. But they'll not remember things anymore. The Lord said so. They'll not remember death and pain and anguish and all. They'll not remember that. It's not going to be part of our existence, which means there are some things that we base our life on down here. Like some people have been hurt so bad. That's how they forge their future based upon their hurt. And that's in vain. The Lord is pointing us to walk our steps out in truth, not by all the pain, misery, sorrow, and everything else we went through. That's why forgiveness is so important, because if a person truly forgives, they're not going to walk forward with all this distress of sorrow and all this other stuff. They're going to be sorrowful enough always, because there's always something you're going to see that's going to cause you some bit of sadness. But you don't have to take that in your tomorrow. Once you start forgiving and you get in the habit of forgiving, you stop carrying that luggage. So you're not walking around as some depressed person. In fact, depression is when you can't get out of a circumstance in the memory of that circumstance and all the stuff surrounding that circumstance, you're stuck. It's almost like you're stuck in your own mind. So the, the situation is worse in your mind than it even is in reality because we carry it with us. But once you get rid of that, guess what? You can be free in a heartbeat. Once you choose not to carry your memories into tomorrow, well, that's when many things change. I told you guys once before, and I tell people, and people have noticed this, but uh, people never get old to me. It, it's almost like people are new to me every day. That's bad for me, or, or it's good for me, but boring to everybody else. Because a lot of people will see me, they, they maybe they didn't see me in five, six, seven years. They always look at me and say, well, you, you look the same. And I'll see them, and I promise you, it's just like the first day I saw them. Everything is fresh with them. And it's because I carry memories of the good of a person, never the bad. Anybody who's ever wronged me, I, I don't carry that with me. I carry the experience this way. If a person wrongs me, then I don't, I don't, I never point to the person and say, that's who they are. I don't do that. I say, that's what flesh is. That's what it's capable of. If somebody were to steal from me, I say, ah, that's what flesh is capable of. I never point, it to, the, point to the person and say, that's who the person is. Because here's a fact. People always change. People change for the good or bad, they change. But flesh is capable of every sin that everybody has ever committed. And that's the way I remember these bad things. I say, you know, it's in the flesh. It's not the person, you guys hear me say that in COG all the time, that the flesh I cannot stand, but I love the person. I separate the two because I know one day the person is going to be free from the flesh. They'll have no desire to do any of those things. Some of you, there are certain things you can't stop doing. You just can't stop doing it. You have tried, you've tried, you feel defeated. Don't feel defeated. Keep giving it a try, but keep living your life. Because one day Jesus will free you from those things. And then you won't do them anymore. Because all those things bound in the flesh. Your cigarette smoking is bound in the flesh. It is. You can you can do your best to try and stop. Just, just go forward with a positive mindset. Do your best to get back on track. But what I'm telling you is that it's Christ who's going to complete the big things for you. And when you die, so will that happen. Your flesh. I'm talking about your old man, your flesh. You'll be freed. There was a dream I had one time, guys. I was in pain one time. Bad pain. I had a dream. I didn't have any pain in the dream. I was so happy because I didn't have any pain. I had remembered. I was in pain and I was very grateful. I was not in pain. And I was clapping my hands in the dream. And then I woke up. I think a nurse woke me up or something. And I woke up and I gave that nurse the meanest look she could have ever had in her life. Why? Because she woke me up from that dream. It was a long time ago. But as soon as I went back to sleep, I was back in that dream. And I knew it was a dream. And I said, oh, Lord, don't let this dream in. Just let me stay here while my body heals. Keep me separate from the pain. Because I understand that, that this pain is comfort, right? All this stuff, if you're not careful, it can weigh on your mind. You really think it's yours. And so then you will let it affect your spirit. And your spirit is downcast in countenance also. Your spirit is suppressed from doing any good. Well, I quit doing that because the body is always going to have something going on with it. Not separate the two. I can be in a high state of pain. 
but get excited about the word of the Lord. I can actually separate the two. Why? Because Jimmy cracked corn, that's why. I don't care about the body and what, if it works, it works. If it does not, it does not. That has nothing to do with my spirit. It is only the body. And so normally I'll say, Lord, just you. You know what you got to do? I want to do this for you, Lord. But the body may slow me down. I trust you to do what you said you'd do and thank you. I thank him for it. And guess what? If he does not do it, so be it. And if he does, thank God he did. But I separate the two. I will not allow my flesh to invade or encroach upon activities of the spirit. Because who I am is the talking spirit, and the flesh is only the vessel. Sure, it has scrapes, scratches. It has a flat tire here. The engine had to get repaired there. The transmission blew out, got put in. You know, we have all kinds of stuff like that. But Jimmy Crack Corn, it is a body that I'm going to be rid of when the Lord is finished with this process for me. Do you see that? You're not your flesh forever. Some people get this idea. They think they're they're stuck. This is the way it's going to be forever. No, it is. You know, somebody close to me. Uh, it was about, I think it was about 4 a.m. They passed. And I was so happy for them. Father, because this guy was suffering. He was one of those guys who would hold on, but he was suffering. You could tell he was suffering. And when he passed, I had to celebrate. Because I know he's not. See, most people, when people die, they really think the person is dead, dead. I don't think of it that way. I think of it that the person transitioned. They are free. That's true freedom. Because I'll tell you something, if the Lord said, Mike, let's go, and he took me, that would be true freedom. Don't you cry for me, because I will not cry. And if you cry for me, it's going to be in vain, because I will not cry. Right? I'm not going to be crying. I'm going to be thankful. So if, if we can accept the truth, the story changes down here where we are called earth. If we don't accept the truth, we're going to continue to follow this book that somebody wrote that's never good. No, no, no story in that book is good. No chapter in the book is good. Everything that you build up is good, falls apart. It's just a terrible book. Forget that book. Give me the Lord's word, right? When we leave this flesh, we are free. There is no death to us. There is only a transition. And see, that's why this ghost stuff on television is throwing people off. Because if you believe this ghost stuff on television, then you believe people are stuck in limbo. And if you believe people are stuck in limbo, it puts confusion around the solid and concrete word of God. But listen to me. Listen to me. How do you really know that you know? you got to ask the Lord to show you. Now, he may take you through some experiences. For some people, they die and they come back to life. They see the truth. For some folks, they take a look at the earth for what it truly is. And they see what's in the, what's all around people. Even I saw one time. And I guess it's, it's one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about Christ. Why I'm so passionate about people not giving in to the flesh. I saw an actual, I saw this in real time. You ever get caught in a daze? You ever just, you're in a daze? You don't know why you went to daze. You're just in a daze. And this happened to me more than a dozen times. I saw something walk in a person and as soon as it got in the person the person went and started hitting on people specifically this one girl this thing was in him and i could see it the entire time and he was hitting on this girl and this girl was kind of rejected she was kind of surprised at first and then something stepped in her and she smiled now i'm sitting there watching this but kind of it's hard to explain i was kind of in a day sitting there watching this so they exchanged information walked away and the guy sat down and he was doing something. I'm sitting there watching this guy. I didn't see what the girl was watching this guy. And when the thing came out of him, it walked right into somebody else and somebody else jumped on the uh, on the little terminal thing. And I promise you they went, they were trying to look for some foul stuff. So this thing was stepping in people. It was just stepping. And every time it stepped out of one person, it went right to another. And it was just doing this back and forth to all these people, just coordinating stuff. And if it's when it stepped into that guy, and it approached that girl, and then something stepped into the girl. I said, oh, my Lord, have mercy. What, what is this? Now, I thought, you know, I thought about that very little the first time. I said, huh. You know, that's one of those things you don't tell anybody because I was wide awake. But it happened again. I was sitting in line at a public place ready to pay for something. And I saw the exact same thing happen again. It walked into a person. I could see what it looked like. I could see it so clear. It walked right into a person. And that person started doing some not so good things. Any spirit that is from the living God is on a mission. They don't roam around just to roam around their purpose. Those called angels messengers. And if God separated us from that realm, 
purposefully, then his angels are going to obey his word and will not breach his veil. So we know anything that's among us are those things stripped of their abilities and other bound to this place. Because in the Bible, you can read that those things are bound to this place, not in the earth, but on the earth. And all you have to do is examine Christ and the demons he cast out, specifically the one legion. And he walked up to this young man who was thrashing himself on the ground. And what did they say? What have we to do with thee, thou son of man? Have you come? Right? They, they want to know, have you come to cast us, you know, into the pit? It's before the time. It's not time for you to cast us into the pit. Now, that's very telling because guess what? That means they're allowed to roam this earth and to do things. But they will only do things to those who have similar desires as they. They have to be compatible by way of your desires. If you do not, Jesus told us a man is drawn away and tempted of his own lust. That's almost like saying these demonic entities can only amplify iniquity in you if you desire the exact same thing they are. They don't want people to know about that. They don't. When you thirst and hunger for righteousness, that thirst and hunger is a strong desire. That strong desire is a person yelling out what they need, what they want, what they need. And the Lord said, if you have that strong desire for those things of him, you're going to be filled. When you thirst and mourn for righteousness, you have a strong desire for it, and you shall be filled. It didn't say maybe. It didn't say possible. It said you shall be filled. Why would such certainty would a person be filled? Because it happens every single time. When you thirst and hunger for righteousness, you are never left wanting. You're never left empty. Well, consequently, when you have lust inside of you for something you shouldn't have, a, a lust is an unquenchable desire. Let's call lust a perverted desire. Because if it cannot be quenched, why have it in the first place? If it cannot be satisfied, why would we have it in the first place? That's why lust is called lust. And when we have lust inside of us, you're calling out for something very specific. And whatever thing is in that department is coming straight to you because you're calling for the unholy. When you do that, you don't have to speak with your mouth. You're calling by way of your desires. All the time, these folks who want to see a, a spacecraft or something like that, why is it? These folks who have a strong desire to see these things, I mean, a really strong, consistent, constant desire to see these things. All right, are those people always saying that? How can they stand next to a crowd? Nobody in the crowd sees it, but the one person does because they're calling out for it. And when you want to see one of those craft, you're not just calling out to see a craft. You're calling out to have faith in something. You're saying, I need something to believe in. Is that it? Because the same people that want to see a craft but the same ones who are saying, where did I really come from? Who do I really belong to? Even in the Bible, it says, when they behold the beast that was and is not, but yet is, they'll wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the earth. Do you know what that means? If you wonder whose names were never, ever, ever in the book of life from the foundation of the earth, then guess what? You're wondering who was even human or not. That means people are beginning to, it's almost like people are beginning to question, did they ever come from God? They're going to begin to wonder, did I ever come from God or did I come from this lineage? So clearly something is going to be introduced because it said when they behold the beast that was and is not but it is. When they behold this thing, when they see it with their own eyes, that's when they're going to wonder, did they come from it? It's going to be like uh, somebody will see this thing. Could be by archaeology. Lord knows they have enough specimens that could show that right now. And people are going to wonder, am I part of this? Because the only way you're not ever written in the book of life is if you're from the lineage of the fallen. The fallen are not in the book of life. And if they're not in the book of life, they're not in the book of life, they're not in the book of life. Do you understand? So it's going to be a lot of people that say, well, I must be part Nephilim. They will use that word because they use it now. You have a lot of people, a lot of influential people, and a lot of political people who believe that they're Nephilim because they have a natural disdain for Christ. That's why they believe they're Nephilim. So when they see it, they're going to wonder whose names were never written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Somebody says, well, what if they put their DNA in you? It does not work that way. They can hijack a person all they want. It just doesn't work that way. What God did, God sealed. Your spirit comes from God. Your flesh comes from this earth. That's why it cannot be redeemed. Your flesh cannot be redeemed. But your spirit comes from the most high, not your flesh. Your flesh is no different than a rock or a tree. 
Your spirit determines who you actually are, not your flesh. See, it is vanity in this world when people go around trying to preserve their flesh. It really shows you what's in their heart. See how much stuff we have to get straight. We have to get all this stuff ironed out so that the average person understands because you guys, want, there are a lot of people who don't know this. They don't know the simple common things like this. And you can get hung up on your flesh in a heartbeat. People have lost sleep because they thought they had, because they had uh, some weird type DNA. It was going to determine if they belong to the most high or not. No, if you're a part of the fallen, you're not going to sit there and wonder, well, I wonder if the Lord loves me at all. You're not going to do that. That's not going to be your question. See, that's, that's why the foundation of the gospel is so important. Lord, it is so important. Yes, Lord, it is so important. It is so important. Because if you don't have that, you're going to be all messed up. Why do you think people were, I'm just going to say, people were scared. They're scared to death of a vaccine, scared to death of everything. I don't fear anything like that on the face of this earth. Jimmy Crack Corner. And I don't care. I don't care. You know why? Because in the Bible it says, you must be born of the what? Spirit. To be born again in the spirit means you're brand new. You're sealed with a seal nobody can remove. It does not matter what your flesh came from. Because everybody on earth is tainted to some degree. So if you're trying to keep your flesh clear of any tainting, you've already messed up because you were born into a giant, giant, giant science experiment, it seems like. But nothing has power to touch your spirit. That's why I was encouraging you to stop being afraid of a vaccine. Jesus died to save your souls, not your flesh. And anything that's put into your body that's meant for harm, it can be changed for, for the good of those that truly love the Lord. I know that firsthand. And all these people who did not take the vaccine are outnumbered by those who did. And the ones who did, many of them had no knowledge of anything that it could potentially do. See how we can create a paradigm sometimes. But that if, if a vaccine could cause you to go to hell, then the entirety of the Bible is no good. This is no good. That's why I said you got to listen to what the Lord tells you to do. If he told you to take the thing, then take it. If he said don't take it, don't take it. You have to operate by your convictions. You have to operate from that, that truth point. Not going across, not going along with the crowd. I've had some dangerous stuff put in me. Dangerous stuff. It didn't do anything. How about that? I've been exposed to deadly stuff. I'm still here. How about that? I've broken things that were not supposed to be healed. Cut things open that were not supposed to be closed. I'm still here. How about that? Jimmy, that's why Jimmy cracked corn. That's why Jimmy, I like Jimmy. Jimmy just cracks corn all the time. You don't tempt the Lord your God. You don't go into your kitchen and say, well, the Lord's going to heal me, so I'm going to cut my arm open. That tempts the Lord your God. But suppose the person does not know somebody has poisoned them and they belong to Christ. The Lord will be the Lord always. Hallelujah. He'll always be the Lord. I already know that. I was poisoned a couple of times. Not from some clandestine mission. No, I was just poisoned a couple of times. And Jimmy Craig Corn. You know what it caused me to do? It caused my eyes to water for about a minute or two. It was like sinus issues or something like that. Then I found out it was a very deadly toxin. But it didn't do anything. You know what doctors say? Well, it, it happens like that sometimes. You're incredibly lucky. I knew what I was. I'm blessed. So when Satan tries to get me from the left or from the right, from the rear, he already messed up. So he's got to come to me from the front. And I have to agree with him before something can be effective. See how that works? That's when you follow the Lord Jesus. Because it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. That all that is only for those who keep the commandments, statutes, and judgments of the Most High. And how, everybody, how do you keep the commandments of God? How did Jesus say you keep the commandments of God? Because Lord knows we broke them all, but how do you keep the commandments of God? Because that scripture, when it says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper, it's only for those who keep the commandments, statutes, and judgments of the Most High. That's who it's meant for. It's for those who are under the blessings of the Lord, not for those under the curses. And when you comply with what the Lord said comply with, then no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Then your enemy will come at you one way and flee several ways. But how do you keep the commandments of the living God? You ready? You stay within the blood of the Lamb. You seek to obey the Lamb of God. You cannot. If you don't seek to obey the Lamb of God, there's no way you can keep the commandments because you're already guilty of breaking them. You have to stay within the blood of the Lamb. Seek to obey the Lamb of God. That's the only way. Because when you belong to Christ, you're the righteousness of Christ by faith. That means you're clean. There's no sin against you. And if there's no sin against you, if you're not guilty by the blood of the Lamb because you have repented and because you choose to stay in Him, now you're clean and a keeper of the commandments because of Christ only. And then and only then, 
then and only then does it apply to you. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. But if you're disobedient, then you've chosen to disobey the Lord. You have rejected the blood of the Lamb, and you're not in a repentant state. So guess what? A weapon formed against you, it will prosper. God is merciful. But don't tell me you haven't been blindsided. Don't tell me that. See, some people try to make a weapon. You just know the name of the Lord. No, nope. the devil knows his name too. Demons know his name too. You're telling me they're blessed? That, that's just not going to cut it. Well, you got to believe he died on the cross. Satan knows he died on the cross. The demons know he died on the cross. That won't cut it. The Bible is very specific. The only way to believe that he was on the cross, died, was raised, he came in the flesh and was raised and sits at the right hand of the Father and shed his blood on Calvary for you is to believe it for yourself. So let me ask you something. Did Jesus die specifically for all of your sins? Yes or no? Do you believe it? Yes or no? Because a lot of people can't believe in Christ, but they have a hard time believing that he died for their sins, that he paid the price in full. So they walk around in self-condemnation. And when you do that, you will not enter into other men's labors. Other men's labors like Paul, like Peter, like John, like all these other individuals who have labored and laid the foundation for the Lord Jesus in his gospel, not their own. You got to believe that he took your place, that he paid the price in full. See, because if you believe he paid that price in full, your head is not hanging down. But you got your head down for because somebody told you you're guilty, right? But you seek to walk in what? In favor of the Lord, don't you? How many of you have a strong desire to comply with Christ, to be pleasing unto the Lord. Because if you do, continue to walk like that. And it's the Lord that will accomplish that in your lives. See, if you seek to be obedient, then you're by no means pursuing a life of disobedience. If you seek to be pleasing to God, you're not going to do the unpleasing thing. You'll give no room to Satan or anything else when you're truly seeking to be this way. And your intent is everything. Because God knows your intent. He knows the exact condition of your heart, and he will complete the good he began in you. That's why you don't hold your head down low, and you do not pause, stop, turn around, go backwards, do anything else, keep going forward toward the Lamb of God. So what if you messed it all up? Get back up and do it again. Go forward. Satan and his minions will always accuse you of what you did yesterday. You should know that by now. Satan will always pull up your past and throw it in your face, Jimmy. Great corn, so what? Satan will always know you by the deeds of those things you did wrong. Big deal. Your father knows you by the blood of the Lamb. You know why? Because if you repented, if you confessed, if you believed that Jesus died for your sins, that he came in the flesh, that he sits at the right hand of the Father, that he went to go prepare a place for you, if you believe his gospel and you honor that and you have a strong desire to obey him, I'm telling you right now, it's the power by way of the Holy Spirit that will complete the obedience in you. And Satan has nothing to say against you. His accusations do not stand. Because all those sins you repented of, turned away from, and you you do not seek to do them again. You don't have a desire to do them. Guess what? The Lord will throw them in the sea of forgetfulness. So when he pulls out the books, there's going to be some things missing. Because if God said he will not remember your sin, then there is no negative deed written down. You didn't think about that, did you? If he said he will remember your sin no more, he'll not bring it up again. It's gone. And the only one that will bring it up is Satan himself. If you have an advocate with the Father, then guess what? You're the ones he'll say well done to. Why? Because you kept the faith. So finish the race. Don't hold your head down. Hold your head up. Don't look around and count everything you lost. Start counting your blessings and do that daily. Listen to me. In this realm, you're always going to have losses. If you know that every day, then why would you count them every day? See, I already know. Uh, Something is going to be lost. Something is not going to go right. Something... It's not going to work out right. I'm not going to count that stuff. Don't be like the world. They're experts on counting everything they lost. They keep inventory of everything they lost. Let me tell you a secret. I'm trying to lose everything here. Because every time I do, I find more of Christ. I have no problem losing everything here. Because in order to go to be with the Messiah, you've got to lose in everything here anyway. And nothing is going to hold me back from that. You know why? Because if something could hold me back from being obedient, from repenting, from ending up with the Lord, then I dishonor the sacrifice Jesus gave us. And I'm just not willing to dishonor him giving his life for my measly life. I'm not willing to dishonor the Father's thoughts. He looked upon you and said, you're worth everything, and he sent his son. So he thinks the world of you. So I will not side 
with Satan to condemn the blessings of the Lord. And I will not count losses because if anything truly belongs to me, it's impossible for me to lose it. But I do know if something is not really mine, it's impossible for me to keep it. I believe the Lord's word. I don't believe the multiple words that come through man's mouth, which is always compromised by their emotions, by their environment, by too much experience or being inexperienced and a lack of vision, lack of sight, lack of everything else. No, I'll believe the Lord and I'll compliment my brother and my sisters. I'll just simply love everybody else. When you trust, it's when everything changes. When you trust, you guys see that. So when you're believing in the Lord, you may ask, well, what feedback mechanism can I use? What can I use for experience? Your whole life. Listen, you'd be surprised what the Lord has given you. Just like you, you don't know if you can move your ear until you look in the mirror and see what, what base configuration you had to have to move your ear. The Lord has given you a lot in your life for experience. And so all you see, we walk down memory lane regardless, don't we? We start thinking about the past concerning people. Lots of people remember every wrongdoing of everybody in their lives. So I give you a challenge. Start changing that. Does it really do any good to know what a person did wrong with all the people you know in your lives? Does it do any good to have an inventory of what they did wrong? No. I'll tell you what's awesome. is if you could remember every time the Lord delivered you from those things you had gotten yourself into or things that tried to get to you. All those times you made those wrong choices. How in the world were you delivered? Because you're right here today. See, if we all were to tell the truth, we'd understand that we made some pretty dumb decisions in life. I know we're in a setting like this, and when you're in a setting like this, you say, yes, it was the devil. But we all know, you know, when it's just us, that most of that stuff was us. We were too greedy, too ambitious, wanted something right now today, right? Got mad because it didn't work out our way, and then, you know, we don't want to talk about that. that not that stuff. We don't want that stuff, you know. But if you start thinking about it, You'll find that the Lord has given you ammunition. He has given you armaments. He has given you some experience that nothing in life can yield to you. It doesn't matter if you did it. See, a lot of people are embarrassed at what they did, that they did it, right? One time I was sitting at a table and somebody says, yeah, uh, Mike, I remember when you did so-and-so. And I said, no, <laughs> you got it wrong. I only told you a piece of it. Let me give you the whole thing. And I shocked everybody because I have no problem doing that. It's quite funny. When you say, yeah, well, I, you have the good part of it. You don't have the whole story. Let me give you the whole story. And it ends up being, you know, 50,000 times worse than what they ever thought. And nobody says a thing and they look at you. That's how you tell a story. But if we were to consider our past that way, instead of saying, yes, they all came against me and conspired. If we, if we would tell the truth and say, well, you know, every time I saw them, I had to turn my head. I couldn't help myself but to give that comment. I knew they could overhear me. That's why I mumbled loud. You know, we would tell the truth like that. We'd understand that the Lord has been delivering us from day one. That when we were spoiled sometimes and were well-deserving of far worse than what we ever received, we would understand that the Lord is gracious and merciful. If we could remember his process, you can only do that by examining the truth of your past. You can't point a finger at somebody else. That's not going to work. Even if somebody did something against you, it's a deliverance moment. If you were a child and somebody as an adult did something against you, that's a deliverance moment. That's a miraculous story. But you can't stop there because you did stuff after that you shouldn't have done and things took place. Right? See, sometimes we get the one story and we want everybody to know that one. We won't tell them what was in between because that was our fault. When we mature and we start making these wrong decisions. But if you can remember, not point the finger, but say, you know what, Lord, you bought me out of all these things. Every single last one of them, you bought me out of it. My goodness. You know what that does? It gives you a feedback mechanism. See, most people have rehearsed what somebody else did to them. Make it a habit of rehearsing how God delivered you. That's when your faith is, incre is boosted by incredible levels. Most people have an issue because when they look back in their past, they have written another story. And the entire story is what somebody else did to them. Now, nobody be offended by this because we're all in the same boat. When we do this too much, when we talk to people, we're always going to have a story of what somebody else did to us. When I tell stories of the past, I always tell stories of the dumb things I did to me. I don't point fingers at anybody in my past. No situation or anything. I don't do that. Do you know why? That's no good. Because the same darkness that used half of these folks 
when I was in the wrong of my life, it used me too. So why point out the darkness in them that also used me? Think about it. Why make that distinction? It's all darkness. So why separate the two? Why would I point out your darkness, but then I was used as a vessel, or, or that same darkness encouraged me to do something too? What's that called? Hypocrisy. So I, I, I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to do that. But I can't tell you without pointing at anybody all those things I messed up when I was impatient, when I wouldn't wait, when I wanted one thing and somebody gave another and I get irritated and jumped too soon, when I said something too quick, when I laughed at the wrong person. See how that works? When people were laughing at somebody and I didn't even interrupt it, I started laughing with them. See? I didn't go to them and say, stop, that's wrong. I didn't do what was in my heart. I tried to fit in with the masses. When you start looking at your life in truth like that, then you're going to find that God has been very merciful, very true, and very consistent in your life. But most importantly, you start remembering, wait a minute, God showed up at the right time, every time. He did not show up based on my impatience. He did not show up based on my vision of an emergency. God showed up at the perfect time. And if it weren't for his deliverance in the last situation, before the bad situation, I wouldn't have gotten through the bad situation. So every time he's delivered me, he's also armed me. That's what you'll start remembering. And then when you do that all the way to the end, that situation you have today, you'll say, wait a minute, this is like the other situation plus some of the other. And I was in this predicament. See, when you, st when you don't rewrite your own story, but you start to see it as it really was. You're not pointing fingers and saying, they did it, they did it. But you're doing self-analysis. You start looking at the truth. You'll also see that God delivered you every single time. Even when he delivered you and you were wounded, it was purposed for you to be wounded. That's how he slowed you down, didn't he? He slowed you down. If he didn't cause you that scar, that health problem, your health would have been good enough where you could have gone out and totally corrupted yourself and your soul. Isn't that the truth? By his love and his mercy and his ways, he slowed us down. He maneuvered us. He did. He encouraged us. He demonstrated to us what would happen if we stayed on that path. Many of us were scared to death because we said, oh my goodness, you know, I'm going to go ahead and do it this way. And then guess what? He said, no, let me encourage you to go the opposite direction. The Lord is so good. Isn't he? If we see the truth, you'll be armed for the south. That's the whole point. So that you're not worried about what's coming, but you're in absolute confidence of the Lord. That's how you have perfect peace when you know that the Lord's got this. You can only have perfect peace when you know a situation is handled. L listen, I face some pretty, pretty extreme uncertainties. And if I'm not careful, I'll give myself a heart attack. But I don't do that because I'll say, Lord, you know, I wrestle with it. I have to wrestle with it sometimes. Sometimes it gets pretty bad and I have to wrestle with it. I'll say, nope, no, I'm not leaving this thought or this moment in my conversation with the Lord until this feeling is gone. You know that feeling you get a worry, that great uncertainty, like the world is about to fall in on you. And I'm telling you right now, there have been times I had to wrestle. The point is, I'll bring up every single point of deliverance I can possibly remember until that feeling is gone. See, I'm, I'm just not going to say, well, I'm going to have faith and then the feeling is there. No, I'm the feeling gone. Because guess what? When I'm not worried anymore, there is no negative feeling. So I will wrestle until that negative feeling is gone. I just don't say, okay, Lord, I put it in your hands and walk off. Nope. I sit there and wait until that feeling is gone. And every time it does not leave, I bring up something else, and 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 I bring up something else. All these are deliverance points of my life. And every single time, you know what happens? The feeling dies. It goes away. It dies. And you know what takes its place? Peace. Listen, with no promise of tomorrow, peace steps in. Not peace because God will handle it the way I want it to be handled. No, by no means. Peace, because when I remind myself of all those moments of uncertainty, all those moments where it was crucial that something took place, he never failed to deliver me. And he did so by his word. And that word still stands. And when you mention enough times of deliverance in your own life, your brain begins to respond. Then it leaks down into your heart. Then it trickles out to the rest of your body. That's when that feeling goes away. That's when you say, thank you, Lord. That's when you take no thought of that disturbance again. Do all of what you can do. But I'm telling you now what you're unable to do, what you have no ability to do, 
Your Lord will never fail. Never look for him to accomplish something the way you want it to be accomplished. But you can count on it that because you belong to him, you will be delivered. You will be delivered every single time. Isn't that awesome? That's when you have perfect peace, when your whole life proves, it proves it, that the Lord will always deliver you. You can be a lot of people with a lot of worries, and they're not going to know where to turn. You may try to talk to some of these folks and say, well, didn't God deliver you from, well, that wasn't my fault, that was their fault. You may have to have this conversation with somebody else. You may have to really get to them and have this conversation with somebody else and tell them, hey, don't, don't point fingers at everybody in your past, because that's an untrue past. But focus on what God delivered you from, that you may have confidence in his deliverance still. If the past is our beginning, then we have to establish that in our minds based in truth, not some story we had to rewrite so it sounds good to everybody else. Never be ashamed of how God delivered you. You don't have to go advertise it. You don't have to tell a soul, but never be ashamed of how he delivered you. There's no law that says you have to go tell everybody how you were delivered. So don't think that way. That's the way people think in the movies and stuff like that. They just have to go tell something. Don't do that. But when you are on your knees with the Lord, when you're thinking about the Lord, don't resort to the book where it was always somebody else's fault. Take that out of your mind and understand that was the Lord's plan for your life and start to see his hand moving all throughout your years. Because I give you a word of caution, if you rewrite your story to make it favorable to yourselves, there'll be no blessing in it for you. It'll just be baggage and luggage because it won't be the truth. You know what the truth is? The Lord has kept you until this very moment. That's what the truth is. The truth is not who did it. The truth is not how many times they did something to you, how many times you did something yourself. The truth is God delivered you every single time. That's what the truth is. Remember that. Don't let negative forces get you to concentrate on whoever did it, on the thing that was done. But realize all of it was dangerous, and but God delivered you from all of it. All of it he delivered you from. He didn't do it in the way that you wanted. He did it in the way that was needed. And listen to me. If something transpires in your life, it's because it has to. See, there's some very tricky speakers coming up. And they're going to guide many away from the Messiah as we know him. And they're going to turn God into a corruptible thing that looks just like humanity. You know that. And people are going to be absolutely and totally undone. Defenseless. And then darkness will be unleashed upon the whole of the earth once the faith of many is crushed. And in that day and that hour, people will mourn. People will cry. Those days will be full of sorrow times because they won't have any faith in those things. That's why right now is a good time to investigate where you are and improve upon your position with the Lord. Learn to be thankful, not complaining, but thankful. And remember, your past is evidence of your Lord delivering you over and over again. And that was in your worst moments. How much more will he deliver you in your better moments? He delivered you in your worst moments. You're not that person anymore. How much more will he deliver you now that you truly desire righteousness and those things of him?